Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Free Speech for Women, Thistle Pedersen and the First Amendment. This is a joint presentation by the Wolf Women's Human Rights Campaign USA and Wolf uh, um, Thistle Peter Pedersen's legal victory last week was a huge win for both her and the radical feminist movement as a whole. But how did we get here? Why was Thistle ever charged with a hate crime in the first place? And could other radical feminists face the same threat? Today, we have Lauren Adams and Kara Dansky to help answer some of those questions. Lauren, will you introduce yourself to the attendees? Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Jessica, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm Lauren Adams. I'm the legal director of Women's Liberation Front, and um, I'm glad to be here today. Thanks so much. Kara, are you with us? Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thanks for coming. Yes, absolutely. Thanks everyone for being here today. My name is Kara Dansky, and I'm currently the president of the U.S. chapter of the Women's Human Rights Campaign, and I could not be happier to be here tonight to discuss this very important case with Jessica and Lauren. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start with um, Lauren. Lauren, could you please tell us your understanding of how this case came to be? Yes. Um, so it started when a turf collective sticker was found on a media box in downtown Madison, Wisconsin, um, belonging to Our Lives magazine, which is an LGBTQ magazine. The uh, owner of the box called the police and said he felt attacked and intimidated by this sticker. And the police devoted what appears to be a full day of resources to um, tracking down a woman on a bicycle on security footage who placed this sticker. Um, and then the man who called the police said he thought it was this thistle woman, um, I think is how he said it, because she was known for some anti-transgender activism, according to him, and he had seen something on social media with this sticker. So they, uh, sent her a citation for uh, disorderly conduct, misdemeanor, and a hate crime enhancer. And gender identity is not a protected characteristic in Wisconsin. So it was from the beginning really unclear why they thought they had uh, a basis for, for doing this hate crime enhancer. Um, because of the LGBTQ magazine part of it, we did suspect that it was based on sexual orientation that they were going to try and get it in that way, but um, but Thistle and her attorneys were unable to get the uh, police report um, before the hearing. So, and it wasn't until the, the Friday before the Monday morning hearing that they received the criminal complaint and that it had been upgraded to felony charges, which was a mistake. And I, um, but then we found out it was not only a turf collective sticker, but also for sure that it was a sexual orientation basis. So um, that's basically the background for the case. Um, it's really notable that Wisconsin and Madison are pretty safe places, but this particular area of town is actually fairly crime ridden. Um, it's right where the county jail is and there's all these muggings and things like that. And so for the police to have put these resources towards, um, towards doing this is really, really notable. Um, yeah. Great, thank you for that overview, Lauren. Kara, you used to be a public defender. In your experience, is this normally how criminal cases arise? So, the complaint itself reads to me, from my experience, like a normal criminal complaint. Complaints like this, criminal complaints, always sound ominous to anyone reading them. And this one is no different. And I'd like to share my screen, if that's all right. Let's see if I can do that. I am sharing this with Thistle's permission. So everyone can see, someone give me a nod. If you can see, yep, okay. So this is a criminal complaint and this is what Thistle received 
on the Friday before her previously scheduled court date. My understanding is that initially, as Lauren said, this was charged as a non-criminal citation, something like a traffic ticket or something like that. <clears throat> and she was given a Monday to appear in court. And it was only on Friday the, before the Monday hearing that she received this complaint. And this is what it says. So anyone receiving something like this would understandably be terrified, right? The above named defendant. If you, if you are said defendant, you, you feel threatened by this, right? It's scary language. And it accuses the defendant, Thistle, of, while being in a public place, engaging in violent, abusive, indecent, profane, boisterous, unreasonably loud, and or otherwise disorderly conduct. And then it goes on to cite the statute. So that sounds very scary. And if you are on the receiving end of this, you would think you, you would, one would ordinarily be quite intimidated by this, especially moving on to the next paragraph, further <clears throat> invoking the provisions and people who are not attorneys will not know what this means. Section 939.645 subsection one and two B. It, it's, it must seem Orwellian to anyone who is not an attorney to receive something like this because the defendant, Thistle, committed a crime under chapters, et cetera, and selected the property that is damaged or otherwise affected <clears throat> by the crime in whole or in part because of the defendant's belief or perception regarding the sexual orientation of the owner or occupant and then the penalty increase. Now, um, <clears throat> what I wanna say though, is that this reads like a very normal criminal complaint to me. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now. This is not unusual at all. Um, as ominous as it must have felt for Thistle, and I know that it did, and as ominous as it would feel to any person on the receiving end of something like this, it reads like a criminal complaint, even though that doesn't take away from the frightening nature of it. What is different here for me is that I have never seen a case where something was scheduled as a non-criminal citation with a hearing scheduled and charges elevated to a crime on the business day before the hearing, which is what happened here. Again, she knew she was scheduled for court on a Monday and she thought it was non-criminal because it was at the time. And the Friday before the Monday, which is the business day before the hearing, she received this criminal complaint in her email from the prosecutor's office. I've never heard of anything like this happening. My understanding is that when the complaint was a non-criminal citation, Thistle's attorneys advised her that she was not obligated to appear at the hearing. This is also normal. It's perfectly normal for attorneys to appear in court on non-criminal matters on behalf of the client. But here, when they filed the complaint, the criminal complaint on Friday, they also sent her a letter informing her that if she did not appear, on Monday at the virtual hearing, a warrant could be issued for her arrest. This is true, but it was also extremely intimidating under the circumstances. So yes, it, it, is, it is somewhat like other criminal cases, but I think that there are also other elements going on here that make it not like other criminal cases. Thank you, Kara. Lauren, you listened to the hearing. Could you tell us how that went, please? Yeah, it was Mr. Toad's wild ride. Um, we, they started out by sending over an amended complaint right before the hearing started, um, which changed very little, but definitely tells us that they read it again and realized how ridiculous it was and still proceeded with it. Um, the Thistle's attorneys argued for dismissal on two grounds. They argued for dismissal of the hate crime charge on what's called statutory grounds, meaning that they did not um, allege facts to support the complaint. 
In this case, it's both because gender identity is not a protected characteristic, and there was nothing about the in the criminal complaint that really supported um, a hate like targeting or a hate crime based on sexual orientation, especially considering it's a turf collective sticker. I mean, if you just like what's anti-gay about turfs, right? Um, so there was that. And before they were even really completely done with their argument, the judge had asked a couple of questions and the ADA was just like, yeah, we concede that the facts of the case do not support um, the, the criminal charges. So that was really, really, um, that was a good outcome for that because they not only didn't object to it, they basically said they agreed to it, but it's really a bad thing that they still proceeded because she completely had all the information to come in and dismiss them herself or withdraw the charges. So then we still had to deal with the disorderly conduct charges and they argued those on constitutional grounds. So first amendment and basically that political statements, political messages are covered by the first amendment. You cannot, you know, be, it cannot be disorderly. Like it didn't meet the criteria of you know, they quoted some case law, talked about how it needs to be like truly, truly disruptive and disorderly. And, you know, a little feminist sticker on a box just does not meet that. And the ADA did not object to that too. And again, they didn't even, um, they said before the argument had even started that they did not intend to object to dismissal on constitutional grounds. So, um, so the commissioner, the circuit court commissioner dropped all the charges and that was really notable too, because um, they, he didn't have to do that. He very easily, it's an initial appearance. It's just, you show up and you say, I got the complaint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're scheduling the next hearing bail. if That's a thing. Um, and so he could have very easily said, you know what, this is, this is not, I'm just going to kick it up to a judge. We'll schedule a hearing for a couple of weeks from now and they can deal with it then. And frankly, if the ADA had objected in any way, I think that's probably what would have happened. But the fact that there was really no, nothing to, to contest was a big deal. So it's good that it ended where it ended, but it also um, was not an inevitable outcome of that. So. Okay. Yes. We'll Thanks, Owen. Um Kara, do you want to talk about your impressions um, uh, about the hearing at all, or? Well, I agree with Lauren completely. I, from my experience being a public defender, I fully expected to, to watch this. So, so to be clear, this was a virtual hearing and um, anyone could watch, it was public. And Lauren and I both watched and Jessica watched as well. And from my experience as a criminal defense attorney, I fully expected the judge to ask, how does the defendant plead? I expected Thistle's attorneys to say the defendant pleads not guilty, which is what happens in 99.9 .9 or something per percent of cases. And then I expected the judge to address questions of bail. And, you know, I didn't expect Thistle to be brought into custody. That would have been beyond the pale of ridiculous. Um, but I did expect some discussion on that topic. And then I expected uh, the commissioner to schedule a court hearing exactly as Lauren said and I was very surprised when Thistle's attorneys came prepared with a motion to dismiss which was great they argued it very well it it seemed to me to be very well presented and Lauren's right that the assistant district attorney conceded I I've never experienced anything like this in my life where criminal ch charges are filed by a prosecutor's office, the hearing proceeds, the defendant moves to dismiss, at the first appearance, the prosecutor completely concedes that the complaint is unlawful and the judge agrees and dismisses it. I was shocked by, I, I was shocked by, by that happening. I'd never seen it happen before. Yeah, that was wild. <laughs> <laughs> that was well, for sure. So continuing on it was, with you, it was Kara, quite a legal argument she made too. Yeah. She said, uh, "What did what was it that it was based on the the incomplete language in the statute, which is lawyers speak for the law right. isn't what I want it to be." Exactly. So, you know. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, that was really something. Um, yep. Okay, so Kara, so then the next thing I'll ask you is, were these charges brought pursuant to a law that criminalizes hate speech or something else then? Okay, so it's helpful to know that there are multiple levels of criminal law where charges can be brought. There are federal criminal laws, state criminal laws, and local criminal laws. And these charges were brought pursuant to a Wisconsin state criminal law against disorderly conduct. I am not aware of a single law at any level of government in the United States that criminalizes so-called hate speech as such. I think our First Amendment stands to protect us against that kind of thing. So the law that Thistle was charged under is a Wisconsin law that prohibits disorderly conduct. And the law says, and this is the language that's reflected in the complaint that we saw before, quote, whoever in a public or private place engages in violent, abusive, indecent, profane, boisterous, unreasonably loud or otherwise disorderly conduct under circumstances in which the conduct tends to cause or provoke a disturbance is guilty of a class B misdemeanor. That's fancy lawyer speak for if you engage in any of this bad behavior, you will be charged with a class B misdemeanor, which is a lower level misdemeanor. Now, most of us would probably agree that this is a reasonable law. No one wants anyone to go around engaging in violent, abusive, indecent, profane, or otherwise disorderly conduct. What makes or made Thistle's alleged offense a so-called hate crime is what is in Wisconsin a punishment enhancement. That law says that anyone who, quote, intentionally selects the person against whom the crime is committed or selects the property that is damaged or otherwise affected because of the actor's belief or perception regarding the race, religion, color, disability, sexual orientation, national origin, or ancestry of that person. So whether or not the actor's belief or perception was correct. So first, as Lauren said, so-called gender identity is not on the list of protected characteristics under the hate crime punishment enhancement in Wisconsin. Now, no one but Thistle knows whether Thistle, in fact, posted a turf collective, collective sticker as alleged. But here's the point for our purposes. To the best of my knowledge, there's still no such thing as hate speech in the US. But what happened here is that the state of Wisconsin, through the Dane County Prosecutor's Office, charged a woman with a hate punishment enhancement by first choosing a crime with which to charge her, in this case, disorderly conduct, and then adding the hate crime enhancement. Now, I've not done a thorough review of all 50 state and the District of Columbia's laws to determine what constitutes a hate crime in every state. But I have taken a look at hate crime laws in two states for purposes of this discussion. And those two states are Florida and Oregon. And I'm using those because they highlight something that's important. Florida law does something similar to what Wisconsin law does, which is that it enhances penalties for crimes if the alleged crime was based on the alleged victim's race, color, ancestry, ethnic ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, national origin, homeless status, or advanced age. In that way, it's somewhat similar, although the categories are different, to the Wisconsin law that Thistle was facing. Thistle was charged with the underlying crime of disorderly conduct, and then with an enhanced penalty under Wisconsin's hate crime statute. The situation is different in other places. Oregon, for example, has a separate crime called intimidation. I'm gonna summarize here because it's long, but the gist is that the crime in Oregon, it is a crime in Oregon to do any of the following things to another person because of your perception 
of the other's race, color, religion, sexual orientation, disability, or national origin. These are the things that you're not allowed to do on those bases. Tamper or interfere with property, intentionally subject the other person to offensive physical contact, intentionally subject the other person to alarm, inflict serious physical injury on the person or a member of the person's family, or cause substantial damage to the property of the other person or a member of the other person's family. What all of this seems to boil down to is that in general, most states probably either make hate crime a punishment enhancement to an underlying offense like disorderly conduct or create a separate offense. That was very legal easy, but I hope it came across. Thank you, Kara. <clears throat> the participants seem to appreciate um, that explanation actually. So it, it, <laughs> it's resonating with them. Lauren, is there any recourse when something like this happens? What structural things went wrong here, if not? Yeah, um, I mean, we already touched on the weirdness of how the police kind of proceeded with the investigation. Um, someone, yeah, someone noted in the comments here too, yes, um, in addition to gender identity, sex and gender are not included either. I'll note that in most places, it doesn't appear to be covered under hate crime, hate speech kind of things, because um, I believe it was the someone in the UK this week said that the police would be overloaded if they included it. And so they just don't. So even in areas where it's included as a protected characteristic for discrimination, it's not usually covered under this kind of thing. So, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, it, it is, it would be extremely unlikely for them to bring these same charges against her for the same thing. I mean, it, even if they wanted to, they really, like they've got themselves on the record saying that they know that the facts aren't there. There is a, a possibility they could, if they wanted to bring other charges um, based on that activity. So the guy said that he had trouble getting the sticker off. So, you know, they could do some criminal damage to property stuff. And there's disability being a, um, a characteristic and gender dysphoria being in the DSM. That's something I don't personally, just from an activist side, I don't think that would be well received by the TRAs, but who knows? Um, so it, it's, it's possible. And the truth is, is that, you know, the guy who called the police, he knows Thistle and he, he, he named her, the police didn't identify her. This guy said, I think this is this person and here's what it is. And so this is part of a, a longer pattern of harassment against her by, um, by a group of extreme activists and their like, and their allies in power. Uh, and I, I hope this took the wind out of their sails in that way, um, that remains to be seen. But the, she's really put herself out there in a lot of ways and, and she's done a lot of really good work on bringing these, these things to the forefront. And um, so I'm really glad that she's fighting back on this stuff and it's really important to do. In terms of recourse, I mean, there is, there's ethics rules for attorneys. They have to, just in Wisconsin, we have a rule that says that prosecutors cannot bring probable cause complaints uh, or cannot bring criminal complaints without probable cause. And um, we have, you know, the ADA on the record saying that that's exactly what they did. So uh, filing an effort, you know, filing ethics complaints or doing things like that. Um, I'm trying to think. So people in, in some of the Q&A brought up different things with malicious prosecution or things like that. And I think those things are all being explored um, and looking at that. And I think both in terms of just justice for Thistle, but also this is this terrible thing with an okay outcome is an opportunity to really uh, make them feel it when they try and do things like this. Um, 
because they, if they're not, if they don't feel it, if they don't feel it in their, their ethics and their professional licenses or being embarrassed or from money from getting sued, it's, it's going to embolden them even more. And we want to not support that. So kind of went all over the place with that one, but. Thank you. Kara, um, is this different from what's happening internationally? So I just wanted to say uh, briefly, just so everyone knows, um, as Lauren said, uh, fiscal's attorneys have advised her that it's possible that other charges could be brought. And that that's my understanding. And uh, I just want everyone to know that Thistle knows that we're doing this and she supports this. So I don't want anyone to think that we're like talking about Thistle without her knowledge or something like that. Um, we're, we're, we're very much interested in protecting Thistle's interests and, and helping her fight this in every way that she can. Um, okay, is this different than what's happening internationally? Yes and no. Um, so my understanding is that Marion Miller, a Scottish feminist, is actually being charged under the Scottish hate speech laws, which are on the books. We don't have those laws in the US because the First Amendment prohibits it. But as a practical matter, it's really not that different in the sense that in both instances, the purpose is to chill women in the exercise of our free speech rights. The reality is that the police and prosecutors are creating an atmosphere of intimidation in the US and in the UK, and I can only speak about the US and, and, and to a lesser extent, the UK. I don't know about other countries. I'm doing my best based on my limited knowledge of UK law and Scottish law. Uh, the police and prosecutors are creating an atmosphere of intimidation for women who speak out about protecting women's sex-based rights, which a turf collective sticker does, whether Thistle stuck the sticker or not. The complaint in Thistle's case states only, as Lauren has discussed, that an individual, and I, I wanna think, I want us to think about this as women going about our day, whether we sticker, whether we leaflet, whether we flyer, the, the criminal complaint that I showed you says this, that an individual identified only using initials contacted the police to report a complaint about a sticker on a media box. I take that to mean a magazine distribution outlet because the complainant, as Lauren said, was affiliated with Our Lives Magazine, Madison's LGBTQ magazine. The complainant then allegedly told the police that it was probably Thistle who had placed the sticker and he used her full name, as Lauren said. This person knows Thistle or knows who she is. The complaint states that a police officer then monitored city camera footage and identified three instances in which a, in the complaint, white female riding a bicycle and wearing a red bicycle helmet and red sandals placed a sticker on a box. He then went to the trouble of finding a state Department of Transportation photo of Thistle and checking her Facebook page. His conclusion, which hasn't ever been proven, is that it was in fact Thistle who placed the stickers. All of this raises an important question. Why are the police going to this much trouble to monitor a woman and her alleged sticker activity? Is there nothing else going on in Madison that the police have to spend time monitoring a woman on a bicycle with a red helmet and red sandals who is allegedly putting stickers on things? Do the police have nothing better to do with their time? Okay, this is eerily similar to what is being reported in the UK. Many of us know Kelly J. Keen Mitchell was questioned by police officers in 2018. Graham Linehan has now been questioned three times. And I'm gonna quote Graham from an email that he sent out to his Substack followers this morning. Again, here, I'm quoting Graham. At the same time, the police have very publicly aligned themselves with a group who try to frighten women enough that they won't defend their own rights, a group that has inserted itself into the LGB flag 
using the grimly appropriate shape of a dividing divisive triangle. Graham, of course, here is talking about Stonewall in the UK. He goes further, quote, again, I'm quoting Graham here. Currently, the police are aligned with an ideology whose foot soldiers openly tried to destroy both J.K. Rowling, a survivor of domestic violence, and Rosie Duffield, another survivor of domestic violence. They are aligned with a woman facing the second longest fitness to practice hearing after Andrew Wakefield. They are aligned with people who blow whistles to drown out the words of feminists. They are aligned with psychotic trolls, Graham's words, who have turned cruelty into a hobby. Those are Graham's words, but I cannot at all disagree with them. Women are frightened, genuinely frightened. That's the end of Graham's quote. Okay, the same thing is true in the US. I'm gonna share my screen again. This image appears on the Madison Police Department's website. Now, to the extent that this means that the Madison Police Department supports lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, such a statement is, of course, great. And I'm confident that Thistle would agree. But we all know at this point that what this actually means is support, police support for the aggressively misogynistic and homophobic concept of gender identity. I'm gonna stop, stop sharing my screen now, that's all right. We all get it, right? All right. Okay, um, the only other thing worth mentioning at this point on the topic of police and prosecutorial intimidation of women is this, because I want us all to be looking out for this. Earlier this year, the San Francisco City and County District Attorney's Office announced a new policy. All employees, all lawyers, investigators, and administrative staff would be required to use preferred pronouns when addressing anyone, including defendants. Witnesses, which include alleged victims, will be encouraged to do the same. What this means in practice is that in San Francisco, District attorneys are now telling alleged rape victims that they need to refer to alleged male rapists as she and her. These are women who claim to have had penises forced into their bodies, and they are being told by the prosecutor's office to pretend that their attackers are women. Women all over the United States and globally need to mentally and emotionally prepare for the same because it's coming. Um, thank you for that, Kara. That's terrible news indeed. Before I ask the next question, I do want to disclaim that nothing about this presentation constitutes legal advice to any of the participants, any of the attendees or anybody that may watch in the future. This webinar is specifically about just to discuss Thistle's case. Um, Thistle has attorneys and Thistle has been advised to not speak publicly about her case. So given, you know, in light of this disclaimer, um, just speaking generally, what lessons are there to be learned from this case? Lauren, I'll put it to you first, please. Thanks, um, and thank you, Kara, for everything you just shared, because that's, it's so important to place all of this stuff in context and to really draw it back to the core of what we're fighting against. I think the level of ideological capture is very extreme. Um, in one of the questions on here, someone had said, I really don't think it's the police, it's the prosecutor, but the, without the prosecutor, the police are the ones who made the decision to respond the way they did to this. It was um, an investigating officer and then a detective, a supervisor had to sign off on 
um, forwarding it to the DA for charges. So there was like a level of, uh, you know, consensus there. And then they sent it to the prosecutor's office. And again, there, there was one person who submitted it, presumably got sign off from the DA or someone higher up. Someone else submitted the amended complaint on Monday morning and a third person showed up to defend it at the hearing. So, and that's very normal, like, you know, in that kind of office and everything, but this isn't just a single individual or even a single entity. This is, um, and this is happening all over the place too. Uh, we are seeing this um, in the American Bar Association has endorsed a model rule called Model Rule 8.4, which uh, the, the, the current iteration, um, it really just addresses harassing conduct on the basis of certain characteristics in the conduct of law or in conduct related to the practice of law. So I can't, you know, go and commit actual hate crimes without violating my professional ethics. And they changed it, they're, they're proposing changing it in a lot of the states, most states are considering taking it up or have adopted it, which would expand the type of conduct that's covered under these ethics rules to include some things that really are considered advocacy as opposed to any kind of harassing complaint and using other terms like discrimination or bias as opposed to just harassment. And it's really intended to encroach on these things. And we should all be very concerned about the pressure that they're putting on lawyers, including judges, to manage their courtrooms in this way. In New York, um, they have a, a ethics ruling for their judicial ethics that says that they must require everybody in court to use preferred pronouns and compared it to racial slurs um, if they do otherwise. And this is what you know, they're being told that they have to do, or you could lose your, lose your license. You could not be a judge in that case. And they're proposing that in Wisconsin. Now our state bar is taking it up. They have a task force going on. And I think we all know that they don't have to use ethics rules like that to have their intended effect, but nonetheless, they are clamping down and this is happening. We know this is happening with doctors, social workers, teachers, and it's happening in the police and it's happening in the law. And um, so we're, we're working right now and gathering a lot of information about that and trying to empower uh, people who work in the legal profession to, to try and advocate against these policies and there's new rules. Thank you, Lauren. Do you wanna talk about um, what, what, we've, um, what we've learned from this case in terms of um, women that may be finding themselves um, engaging in distribution of literature or stickering or anything like that? Yeah, again, not legal advice. Not legal all. advice. So, um, but just, we do have constitutional rights and one of them is the right to remain silent. And um, it was, it is, once you are being uh, accused of a crime, it is rarely to your benefit to speak about it to the police without counsel. So I think that the, the instinct to defend yourself when you're encountered in that kind of thing should probably, you know, be, just remember you have the right to remain silent. That's what I would say. Don't talk to the cops. Yes. Um, that was good, good on Thistle to do that to not talk because they were not able to say, they had to come in in their criminal complaint and say, yep, she didn't say whether she did it or not. So it, even if it, it's another barrier for them to, to come after you because then they know they have to prove it because you didn't admit it. So that's really what I would say, um, you know, things at your own risk. I, you know, I know people are concerned about getting charged with things um, and, uh, if you're if you're concerned, just I would look into the laws in your local jurisdiction and talk to an attorney if you're concerned about a particular thing and just know that any kind of advocacy, any kind of direct action is a risk, even if it shouldn't be, even if we know it's not a crime, you know. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Kara, would you like to add to that, please? Lessons learned from this case. 
Yeah, thanks. Lessons learned. Um, one lesson learned is that even though we don't have hate speech laws in the US, and I don't believe that we will, I predict that the federal judiciary will protect the First Amendment because men wearing black robes care a lot about their right to speak. So I think that we are not going to see hate speech laws in the US. However, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that US women are immune from being intimidated by the police and or charged with a crime because we stand up for women's sex-based rights. Even though they can't go after our speech directly, they can do it indirectly using other criminal charges, which is exactly what I think happened here. Um, and then just building on some of the things that Lauren just said, uh, yes, please, if you are approached by the police, please uh, do not say anything. That's, that's absolutely the best policy. Going further, my understanding, and, and I'm old, it's been a long time since I've been in law school, but my recollection from my criminal procedure course for my second year of law school is that in order to establish your right to counsel during police interrogations, you have to be as explicit as possible. So if you find yourself under police interrogation and you want a lawyer with you, which you should, you have to say, I will not speak with you without a lawyer present. Just say those words. I will not speak with you without a lawyer present. Say them unambiguously and say them as many times as you have to. And I'll also just build on something else that Lauren talked about, and I know we need to get to Q&A. Um, yeah, on the topic of the legal profession, I'm licensed to practice law in two jurisdictions, one active and one voluntarily inactive because I haven't been there in several decades. And in that one where I'm voluntarily inactive, I've been paying bar dues for decades now, even though I don't practice there because I don't know, I might move back. But earlier this year, I got an email from them explaining to me that they're changing the ethics rules and they're changing the ethics rules to mandate that all attorneys licensed to practice in that jurisdiction take a course on diversity and inclusion. We all know that sounds like a nice thing. Diversity and inclusion sounds like a nice thing, but I can see right through it. I know exactly what they're doing. And it's not, these mandatory courses typically have to do with practical advice on how to practice law. But if I know anything about our opponents, I know that this course is not going to be practical advice on how to practice law. It's going to be stuff on how I need to uh, be better in my use of preferred pronouns. Um, so I'm most likely going to, uh, resign and, and simply no longer be a member of that particular jurisdiction because I see no reason to pay bar dues in a jurisdiction that's going to make me uh, be better in my use of preferred pronouns. Okay, great. I um, will let that lead me right into the first question that I think is good for the Q&A, which is the following. It's actually so, um, two inspired by two questions I saw. What are some good strategies for avoiding this coerced speech? And are there possible repercussions for failing to in engage in the, in the coerced speech? Um, Lauren, do you wanna take that first? Sure. Um... This is a tough question and it has a legal answer and a practical answer. And the legal answer is that it is probably unconstitutional and has not been tested. And the practical one is that it's not the only consideration if you're testifying in court on something or if you're arguing a case, if you're an attorney, um, how much you want to push certain buttons. And it's a really unfortunate calculation that needs to be made sometimes. Um, a tale of two cases is just last year, there was uh, two sports cases being argued, one in Connecticut, 
one in Idaho, both were represented by ADF Alliance Defending Freedom. In the first one, the judge ordered them to only use transgender female, transgender girl, transgender woman um, to describe the athletes who were self-IDing onto the girls track team. And ADF fought that. They asked for a recusal of the judge. He refused. They appealed it up to the appeals court. They rejected it. And that's not good on them for fighting it. And I, I'm glad they did, but it also didn't set up a great relationship with the judge, right? And so that was always, that's always a risk. So same, different case, same topic, same attorney. They got ordered in the Hecox case in Idaho to do the same thing. Um, and they did not fight it. Because you still at the end of the day have to advocate for your, um, for your clients. And so it's not a, a fun choice to make. And lawyers often have the unenviable position of having to do and say things that we don't ourselves believe or are not like the most purest thing because we have to use our own professional judgment to get the outcome that we need. And it's really, really unfortunate, um, but it hasn't been tested really. So that's as far as I know, that's the most it's gone up. The one case that's really addressed it head on is USB Varner in the fifth circuit. That was also from last year, early last year. Um, a pedophile had asked, a male pedophile had asked the, that his um, record be re redacted or changed to reflect his new female gender identity. And this was in Louisiana and they were not having his argument at all. And they uh, basically said no. And they also called out that not only is it probably unconstitutional, but it violates judicial neutrality, which is a huge problem. So that's the, it's not binding on other jurisdictions. It's the only case still standing. There's been some other things. There was a California case where they struck down um, recently. It wasn't in court, but it had to do with uh, nursing home staff using preferred pronouns. And so there's a lot of movement there, but it's an unexplored area and it will continue to come up for sure. Yeah. Could I jump in on that, Jessica? Yes, please do. Yes. Yeah. So, um, Aside from the question of how the question of how these questions about how to refer to people and compelled speech are proceeding through the federal judiciary, and they are in exactly the ways that Lauren said, um, as far as just normal us, like normal normal humans, I, I, I guess I just want to get out there the idea that it is actually much less hard to refer to people in the third person using a last name than it seems like it would be. It often seems like it would be really, really awkward. And sometimes it really is. But I found myself able to write a three or four page blog post in which I was being extremely critical of Chase Strangio. And I just referred to Chase as Chase. I just said Chase. You know, you can use a first or a last name. Chase is Chase's legal name. That sounds weird, you know, but I, I just did it. I just avoided the use of pronouns completely. Nobody can get mad at me for calling Chase Chase. Nobody can charge me with a crime for calling Chase Chase, right? Like if I used the pronoun that Chase doesn't like, I could potentially get in trouble for defamation. But if I just call Chase Chase, which is Chase's legal name, it's slightly awkward, but we can do it. You know, we can avoid legal trouble just by using the names that, you know, people want to be called. I have a slightly different issue with Clymer. Clymer, I will refer to by last name only. That's a different issue. But, uh, but you see my point, like we can actually um, avoid compelled speech by stating truth. But not if I want to walk into court and say, that's a man. That's the only thing, but for the most part it is, but we run into these issues. If I, we want to say that's a person with a penis also known as a man and he shouldn't be in this prison or on that sports team or taking up that 
you know, spot that's reserved for a woman. So there's going to be a bunch of, this is not going to be a linear process at all to, to get this worked out. For sure. I took the question, <laughs> like, what can, what can women on the ground do? Not what can attorneys do? Okay. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, I think that is a, a good strategy. And as one of the chatters points out, it's not any more awkward than using the incorrect neo pronoun. <laughs> so, so, um, la so legal names and last names, it'll be. I think the last, the next question I want to go to, maybe the last question, depending on how it goes, would be what can we do now to support Thistle? in this, um, who wants to take this question? Well, I, I feel like Lauren, you've been in more recent contact with this so you may know better than I do. You just looked like you were gonna unmute. That's why I was waiting. Um, I think, you know, Thistle uh, is, she's follow her on social media and you know she's got wlrn and she's really involved and so i think if she does end up she is exploring her options in terms of trying to right some of this wrong and if she does get a strategy together there might be costs associated with that and so i would definitely say um oh and i'm gonna uh this will just put her, I'm going to go ahead and put this in the chat here. Um, that this will just put, she's got to give butter. So she's, she's working on it. So you can, you can contribute directly to her. And also just the work that all of our organizations are doing um, on this issue, both not just, you know, not necessarily on Thistle specifically, but in trying to bring awareness to this, we got direct action and legal advocacy and education. And so just, you know, any organization of ours or others that you are in support of, just follow us, get involved, find out what's going on and, and get involved how you can. Kara? Well, just someone said in the chat that Thistle's here in the chat. And so you can send her some love and that's a great thing to do. Like, let's, let's send Thistle all the, all the love. Um, Thistle knows, <laughs> look at that. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> right on Thistle. We love you. <laughs> that's really beautiful. I would say subscribe to WLRN, follow them on Twitter, uh, subscribe to their YouTube, their SoundCloud everywhere, listen to everything they put out. It's uh, really a wonderful um, uh, work that she does. It's a wonderful labor. Um, she's kind of the, um, the archivist <laughs> of a contemporary, the contemporary rad radical feminist movement. So thank you Thistle for all the work you do for radical feminism. Thank you for being such a great representative, certainly of the Turf Collective. You do us proud every day. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If I know Thistle at all, she's like looking at this chat and probably melting and giving us all a big hug back. Before we close up, Karen, did you wanna say anything else there? Not unless there are any other questions. I'm happy to take any other questions until, you know, for the next 10 minutes or so. Let's see if we have anything else. I was going to ask um, you each to speak about your organizations, what you're doing now, and how any of the attendees can fold into your work if they're so in inclined, if, if they'd like to plug in, what can they do? Lauren, if you'd um, go ahead first. Sure. Um, well, you can follow us on social media too. And we uh, also have some volunteer opportunities available soon. We just posted some new ones, uh, some uh, getting some help with social media content and blog writing and things like that, as well as looking for attorneys and paralegals 
to help with some brief writing and some other uh, legal research and writing. Um, if that's your jam, get in touch. Uh, and uh, yeah, and donate too as well. Um, we can always use that. We also have a legal action fund that we are using um, for those for those things that we're doing as well. So that's what I would say, um, getting involved. And we're really just working on a lot of the free speech stuff and prisons. We've got some stuff coming up with that writing, um, gonna be submitting some, um, some briefs soon. And we've just got a, a number of things kind of gearing up for we're working on. Thank you, Lauren. Kara, would you like to tell us about your work with WHRC? What can participants do? Yeah, absolutely. If you haven't already, please go to www.womensdeclaration.com and sign the declaration. This is a global declaration for women's sex-based rights. Anyone can sign it. And um, it's got over 20,000 signatures so far from several hundred organizations. And I think around 400, um, I'm sorry, from several hundred countries. And I think from around 400 organizations. Uh, so please sign the declaration, www.womensdeclaration.com if you haven't. And then if you're in the US and you have signed the declaration, please go onto our website, www.womensdeclarationusa.com where you can find our volunteer application, submit the application. One of our volunteer coordinators will be in touch with you. And that's the best way to get plugged in to promote the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights throughout US law and policy. And beyond that, of course, follow on social media. Um, what US uh, attendees may not know is that there are a ton of WHRC chapters on Twitter. So there's WHRC USA, which many of you probably follow. And if you don't, please do. But there's also WHRC Norway and WHRC Germany and WHRC Spain and WHRC Brazil and WHRC Argentina. There's so many WHRC chapters to follow and give some love and support to if you don't already. I wanted to just say a quick thing about something I saw in chat, which was, is there a group of feminist attorneys to get in touch with if you need help? And this is such an important question and it's such a difficult one. And I'm totally putting Lauren on the spot. I'm not, someone in chat did, but I'm doing it now. Which is to say this, of course, most people don't understand that attorneys are, are often limited in terms of our expertise, right? So I have some experience in criminal law, but most of my, even though I'm an attorney, most of my experience has been in legislative analysis and criminal justice policy and feminist analysis and feminist policy. The only area in which I've ever formally practiced law in a courtroom is in criminal defense, but that was not in the state where I'm currently licensed. Lauren is licensed in Wisconsin. I'm not. It, it's so hard and it's completely understandable that people don't understand these limitations because why would anyone? But no one can practice law in a jurisdiction where they're not licensed and no one is an expert in the law in a jurisdiction where they're not licensed. And no one is an expert in the law in an area in which they, they're unschooled or unfamiliar. So it's such an important question. And it's something that I really feel like we need to be building up, but we're so far from being there yet. So here's the part where I put Lauren on the spot. Lauren, what do you think? Do you disagree with me? Do you think we're there yet? I think that one of the things that would be most valuable is working on peaking more lawyers and getting them because where they stand, it is my dream to make a continuing education course that gets approved for credit by the ABA. I have all kinds of plans in my, like the playground in my head of what I want to do um, to focus on this specifically. And yes, I think, you know, it is, it's gonna be so hard. Like I, uh, finding a criminal attorney in this place who does this thing and, and all that, I think it's, I think in terms of our limited resources, focusing on educating um, the people who shape and practice the law is gonna, yeah, law schools are tough. I see that in the chat. We've, we got these 
law students tried to cancel us from the employer job fair earlier this year. Um, they had a whole tantrum about it and they got other employers to withdraw from the job fair as well. Um, so that's certainly a battle that needs to be fought. They're subject to the same pressures as any other parts of the university. Um, yeah, and remember also, you know, I, I mentioned the San Francisco prosecutor's office is the one who is enforcing this pronoun mandate. Public defender offices are gonna be doing it too. Public defender offices are gonna be referring to their male clients. I had overwhelmingly male clients. I mean, I had several female clients, but mostly male clients. Um, public defender offices are gonna be reinforcing these pronoun mandates as well. It's like, it's a tough battle in the legal profession. Well, for our part, Turf Collective has come up with some pamphlets in the meantime that we can distribute at college campuses, law schools, stick them wherever you can. Maybe avoid uh, mailboxes because that will get you into trouble. Um, but it's, it's something. I think we need to normalize um, our position on this, the position of biological reality. That's really going to be important. Uh, Lauren and Kara, do you, either of you have anything else you want to add before I close out our webinar? I want to very much thank Wolf for hosting this event. I want to thank you, Jessica, for facilitating and monitoring. I'm very glad we had the conversation. I have not been able to follow chat closely, but it looks like it was lively. So that's great. And I really hope everyone enjoyed the discussion. Lauren? Yeah, I the same. I'm I'm so glad that we decided to do this. Um, you know, we were we were gonna do like a like maybe a statement or a letter or something. And then we said, you know what, people have a lot of questions. We should really just get in front of everybody and give everyone a chance to ask what they need to ask. And I I, I hope we do this more often because this was really fun and I think it um, you know. So thanks everyone for coming. I'm so glad I work with all of you. I think we all feel the same. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, Kara. Thanks, of course, to Wolf for hosting this, WHRC. Thanks to all my sisters in Turf Collective here in the chat. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you so much for coming.